Look, I begin by asking a simple question. On what occasions have you felt most embarrassed or even ashamed to be exposed as a Christian, a follower of Jesus and a part of his church? What occasions have brought the most embarrassment or even shame to you to be exposed as a Christian? Perhaps you're thinking of a time where you were concerned what others might think or say or how they might react if they found out what you truly believe about Jesus Christ. I remember in my own life, I had just recently become a Christian and I was attending the birthday celebrations of a friend. Uh, toward the evening, as uh, I was getting ready to leave, I remember a well-intoxicated acquaintance of mine coming up to harass me for becoming one of those Jesus people. And I still remember clearly that sudden rush of unexpected discomfort and even shame for being, for being exposed as a, as a Christian. Maybe you can relate to that. Some moment in which being exposed as a Christian gave you the jitters. If so, if you know of moments like that in your life, this passage offers us help. It fortifies us against the shame we might feel for being exposed as Christians with a readiness to share the gospel, strength to endure opposition to the gospel, and the sensibility to protect the gospel message. If not being ashamed of the gospel, if not being ashamed is central to this passage, a proper place to start then would be with the good news of the gospel. If the passage is about not being ashamed of the gospel, let's think about the gospel itself. How did the apostle present the gospel in this, in this text? How did he tell us about the gospel that we are not to be ashamed of? I want to submit to you that the apostle sets out the gospel or he hinges the gospel on three things. There are three things that he's going to tell us about the gospel. Firstly, he's going to tell us what we are saved from. He's going to tell us what we are saved for. And he's going to tell us what strength we can get through our salvation. So he's talking about what we are saved from, what we are saved for, and then strength that we get through that gospel message. Have a look at verses 9 through to 10 with me. He begins, God saved us. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So firstly, the gospel is really good news about what we are saved from. It is news about what we are saved from. The good news of the gospel is at bottom a declaration of our rescue from sin, death, and judgment. We have a problem that needed fixing. We have sinned against God, and so we require rescue from God. And the rescue comes in the form of being forgiven through Christ Jesus, our Savior, who made a payment for the violations we've committed against God in our stead. This is the good news of the gospel. But the gospel, to use John Stott's words, is far more than forgiveness. It's not less than forgiveness, but it is more than forgiveness. The gospel is also the declaration about what we are saved for. We are certainly saved from something, but we are certainly saved for something. Have a look again at verse 9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling. 
He saved us, but he also called us to a holy calling. That is to say, the gospel is not only good news of being rescued from sin, death, and judgment. It is also good news of rescue for a particular way of life. I once had this unnerving experience of seeing one of my children being swept out in a rip. We were at the beach and I could see one of them being uh, dragged out. And I rushed toward them and grabbed at them the best I could. But I also realized in that moment I was losing my own footing, which which was what made the problem far worse. There were now two of us in trouble. And wasn't it for this behemoth of a man, I don't know where he came from, we were uh, certainly by my estimation one of the only people on the beach at that time, but this behemoth of a man, must have been well on six feet tall, grabbed both me and my son and and, and pulled us out of the rip. He very calmly looked at me and said, are you guys all right? (laughs) I wasn't, but I am now. Look, I don't know what would have happened if it wasn't for that person that day at the beach. But this is what I'm getting at. The gospel is good news of being pulled out of trouble so that we can get on with living the rescued life. The gospel is good news about being rescued from a terrible situation so that we can get on with living a rescued life. And part of this rescued life involves people discovering that we are Christians, that we are followers of Jesus, and that we are a part of his church. And that is the thing that may bring some of us some discomfort. That is the part that would bring some of us discomfort. For various reasons, there are circumstances in which we are apprehensive or anxious about letting slip that we are Christians. So we're asking, what is it about the gospel? What is it about the good news of Jesus Christ that would help us overcome this inner conflict that many of us feel about being exposed for what we really are? That we are Christians, that we are followers of Jesus, and that we belong in this church. How do we overcome that inner conflict we feel for being exposed for who we really are? Verse 10 is what points us in the right direction. Our Savior, Christ Jesus, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Overcoming our sense of being ashamed is connected with the confidence that we gain through the good news of the gospel. Overcoming a sense of shame is connected to the strength that we gain through the good news of the gospel. And here's why. Because the good news of the gospel addresses one of our greatest fears, death. The good news addresses one of our greatest fears, death. In the good news of the gospel, we hear that Jesus made death ineffective. He made it ineffective. Come grab a seat, my friend. You're welcome here. He made death ineffective. Death in the Christian view of things has lost its deadly firepower. Many moons ago, many moons ago, I found an unusual but deadly looking bullet on a family farm. And just to demonstrate how unusual this bullet was, we set out some containers, some cans for target practice. And one of my family members, I think it was my uncle, he took one of his bullets and he shot one of the containers which promptly burst, showing the deadly firepower. And then he shot my bullet But all it did was make a sound. There was no impact. It made a sound, but there was no impact. My bullet, it turns out, 
was a blank. It looked like a deadly bullet. It sounded like a deadly bullet, but it didn't have the same deadly firepower. Death, in the Christian view of things, has lost its deadly firepower. It might look the same, it might sound the same when the time comes, but it has been scraped empty of its deadly power. How? How can death itself be scraped empty of its deadly power? Because Jesus, our Savior, who in his resurrection came back from the dead, triumphed over death. Death had to let him go. Death could no longer hold him. And so in that moment, Jesus hollowed out death's deadly power. And with that, he brought guarantee to his church of life and immortality. Death couldn't hold him, so death cannot hold his church. Now this does not mean that Christians no longer die a physical death. Christians die we know that but death in the christian view of things is at worst a transition into eternal life with god the same apostle who was writing this letter to timothy said in another place he said for me to live is christ and to die is gain for him to leave his earthly body is to be with christ that is how we viewed things. He might die, but the moment he dies, he is going to be with Christ. Death, or all that death can now do to Christians. And Timothy Keller is the one who said this in the shadow of his own death, is to make their lives infinitely better. All that death can now do to Christians is make their lives infinitely better. This is phenomenally good news, wouldn't you agree? That the thing that we fear most, death, has been dismantled by Jesus. And so here's the question. If Jesus dismantled the thing that we feared most, is it not possible that he would be with you when you are facing a far lesser fear? Like the fear of being exposed for who you really are, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a member of his church. If Jesus dismantled the thing that we ought to fear most, death, is it not possible that he would be with us when we face the lesser fears in life? Like the fear of being exposed. I do believe so. I do believe that the good news of the gospel not only tells us what we have been saved from, it not only tells us what we have been saved to, more than that, because death itself has been confronted by Jesus we develop a realistic confidence, and it is a realistic confidence, that lesser fears, like being exposed as a Christian, is not as daunting as we might first imagine. These are all glorious gospel truths, a platform from which to turn our thoughts from the dread of being exposed as Christians into a readiness to share the gospel, to endure opposition to the gospel and a sensibility to protect the gospel message itself because the glory the gospel is such good news about what we have been saved from and what we have been saved to and the strength and encouragement we can get from the gospel we are, are on the platform now about when we can talk about sharing the gospel and being strengthened against opposition and a sensibility to protect the gospel itself so if you're willing, let's think about sharing the gospel. Let's think about sharing the gospel without being ashamed of it. Let's think about sharing the gospel without shame. 
I'm taking my cue here from verse 11, remembering that Paul, the, the guy writing, the apostle writing, through no sin of his own, remember, through no sin of his own, was in a prison. He was on death row in a stinky, probably underground Roman prison cell with little more than a hole in the ceiling for fresh air and light. And even some of his former allies have now turned against him. The apostle found himself in the very place that would amplify his sense of being ashamed for the gospel. He is in the very environment in which he would feel the most awful or the most embarrassed about being a Christian. He's in jail. His friends have leave, are leaving him in, in droves. Surely that is the place where he would most intensely feel a sense of shame. Yet even there, shame barking at him from the shadows, he confidently maintains, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I'm in my prison cell. My friends are leaving me. It looks awful. It looks like I'm about to be executed. But I am not ashamed. Man, that's a powerful testimony, isn't it? Isn't that just gripping? That someone would say something so daring, so audacious? I am not ashamed. I think it is tremendous testimony. And what I want us to focus on are Paul's words. I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher of this good news of Jesus. You know, technicalities aside, like the cessation of the apostolic ministry after the death of Paul and his fellow apostles, there is instruction here for us. Though Paul was somewhat different from us in that he was personally commissioned by Jesus to be an apostle, he was also a preacher and a teacher who shared the good news of Jesus all around as he had opportunity. The question is, how did the good news of the gospel enable him to do this even in his darkest hour? What is it about the gospel that, that Paul is so relentlessly sharing the gospel? Why? Why keep going when you're in jail? Because he was saved from sin, death, and judgment, and because he was living out his holy calling, the opinions of others don't bother him as much as it used, might, have, might have in this past. He knows who he is. He knows what he's been saved from. He knows he's living his holy calling before the face of God. And the opinions of others just don't seem to rattle him like it might have in younger years. And because he no longer lived in that debilitating fear of death, he gained confidence to share the gospel of Jesus until he too would cross death straight to his Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the first bit of gospel help in turning our dread of being exposed as Christians into a readiness to share the gospel as God gives us opportunity. Secondly, let's think about strength. Let's think about the strength to endure the opposition that we face as Christians. True, we don't generally warm to situations of opposition and conflict. That's not that very few of us gravitate towards difficult territory, relationally or otherwise. But this is right for Christians to know that some people... There will be situations in your life that you ought to just be aware of. Just be, don't let it 
catch you completely off guard that there will be people who oppose the gospel message and therefore they will also oppose the gospel messenger. They don't like the message and so they will also oppose the messenger. The apostle knew this in his own life. Even the apostle who was the most fruitful and the most convincing evangelist in all of church history once said, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Even the most, um, even the most competent evangelist in the New Testament had to recognize that there would be moments in which his message of whom, of whom he is a true messenger, would just fall flat. People wouldn't want to hear him on it. If so, what strength can those who share the gospel then, those who present the message of Jesus Christ, what strength can they have when faced with opposition? Where are we going to look for the strength that we need? Look at verse 12 with me. The apostle says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. I want you to notice what the apostle is doing here. He is reaching way into the future in order to draw strength for the present. He is, he is looking way down into, into future to come for present strength as he shares the gospel often opposed. He's thinking at the very worst his opponents might succeed in silencing him as a messenger of the gospel. Yep, they might do that. They might take his head right off his body. They might silence him but they cannot silence God, who ensures that the good news will spread throughout the world. Paul said, I'm convinced that God is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. God is able to guard that thing until that day. Paul had been entrusted with the gospel and God would guard that gospel from being extinguished. The gospel in Paul's mind will prevail. And that gave the apostle tremendous confidence and strength to endure the present opposition which he experienced as a messenger of the gospel. He knew he was on the winning side. He knew he was playing for the winning team. History could not change for the worse. The gospel will prevail. They might kill me, but the gospel cannot be silenced. God will guarantee the future of gospel proclamation. And this is our second help in turning our dread of being exposed as Christians into strength to endure opposition for the gospel. Lastly then, I just want us to briefly think about being sensible, about protecting the good news of the gospel. Look at verse 14 with me. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You know, the question comes to mind, if this is an instruction from the apostle to Timothy to guard, to guard the good deposit to guard the gospel. The question is, what is Timothy supposed to guard it from? What is the imminent threat? What scheme is being devised against the gospel that suddenly has to have Timothy on guard and watchful? In one sense, I think it is fair to say that the gospel is always under threat from heretical distortions. It is always under threat from being distorted in various ways through external factors. 
The church, therefore, has always had a duty to protect the gospel from external corruptions. But the more pressing issue for Paul was that the threat of the gospel uh, was that the gospel was being threatened by internal dilutions. It wasn't uh, an imminent external threat that we're talking about right at this minute. It was an in internal threat to the gospel. It came from within the church. See, among Paul's contemporaries, a number of people who had formerly associated with the gospel and Christ had succumbed to the dread of being exposed as Christians. They no longer wanted to be associated with Jesus or his church. And why would they? Why would they want to be associated with Jesus and his church? When the spokesman of the early church, the pioneer of missions, the one who worked so hard to present the gospel, ended up in a Roman prison. Consequently, within the church world, there were people questioning the gospel. Maybe Paul had this gospel wrong. Maybe the nations wouldn't come to Christ. Certainly, according to verse 15, there was something that caused these two people for jealous and homogenes to waver and disband their association with the church, the gospel, and the apostle. So when Paul said to Timothy, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you, he's just sobering Timothy up to the reality that there will be people who were once allies that may disband their association with Christ and the church. And they may look to another gospel. They may look to another hope, but not to Christ. So be on guard, Timothy. Don't join them. Guard the good deposit. Guard the purity of the gospel now and for always. This is our third gospel help in turning our dread of being exposed as Christians into sensibility to protect the gospel from distortion. Let me wrap this up for us. Personally, I know there are moments when we might feel embarrassed or even ashamed to be exposed as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and to be members of his church. Our scripture passage is aware of this. This is not, the, the scriptures sympathize with you. They, it understands that that is a true pressure that Christians sometimes face. But it encourages us to think deeply about the gospel itself, to think deeply about what we have been saved from and what we have been saved to, and also the strength and the confidence that we gain through our salvation. As we do so, as we think deeply about this gospel and its fully-fledged forms, maybe we too will find ourselves overcoming that dread of being exposed as Christians. More than that, by the grace of God, to find ourselves motivated to turn our dread into an opportunity to share the gospel, strength to endure opposition to the gospel, and a sensibility to be very protective of the purity of the gospel. Let's pray together.